Hey folks, this is Aestus, back again with a Boulder's Gate 3 spell tier list. This is the last spell level we have to cover. I know I've been away for a while. I'm sorry, I've been traveling. I'm now back home and kind of getting into the groove of things before I have to travel again for the Christmas holidays. A lot has happened since then. We have got the release of a new patch, which included a new mode and a very important new mode, honor mode. It increases the difficulty of this game significantly and changes a lot of the systems in this game. I am working very hard to uh, master this mode of Baldur's Gate 3, and in the future I will be making videos exclusively for Honor Mode. This will probably be my last Tactician Mode video. Also, a very quick community announcement I need to make, I will make at the end of this video. If you consider yourself a member of my community, I recommend that you listen to that. I think it will be very exciting. If you're just a guest, probably won't interest you that much, so feel free to ignore it. Finally, before we dive into ranking these spells, as we always do, I want to review what the tiers mean. I use a five-tier system, S to RP, with S being the highest. An S-tier spell, for me, is a spell that is either consistently amazing, and by amazing I usually mean a fight-deciding spell, or an S-tier spell can be a spell that is meta-defining and worth building around. That is S-tier. A-tier are spells that are consistently good or situationally amazing. Similarly, B tier is for consistently average or situationally good. A C tier spell in my system is a spell that's generally underpowered as a rule of thumb. You can ignore C tier spells and you won't be losing out on that much. And then finally, the bottom tier is our P tier, which stands for Roleplay tier. This is the tier for spells that don't really have a combat use, and the only real reason to cast them is for roleplay reasons, which are completely valid. So these can be a lot of out-of-combat spells that have no direct or indirect combat utility. It could also be a combat spell that is so badly outcompeted by a competing spell that does the same thing that there's no reason to prefer it over its competitor. Okay. Let's dive into the spells now, guys, starting with Arcane Gate. I am putting Arcane Gate into B tier. Here is what this spell does. You are going to summon two portals within an area that is 18 meters from you and that you can see. These portals are now connected spatially, and you can move between them with zero movement, right? So if you click on one portal, it's just going to take you to the next portal. It's a very good mobility spell. It can completely change the terrain of combat because these portals last for as long as you maintain concentration. If this was a fourth or fifth level spell, I would like it much more. The problem is that it's a sixth level spell, and this is a good time to talk about it. Six level spells are different than all of the other spell levels in that they are extremely rare and valuable resource. You only get these if you have 11 caster levels in your character. So that means at least 10 levels of a full caster, and then you can go uh, two levels of a half caster, one more of a full caster, you know, anything like that. That is the only way to get these. So you're getting these somewhere around early act three. And that means in my rule set, where I only allow for five rests per act, I get, and you only get one of these spell slots per long rest, by the way. So with five long rests, I'm getting around six, five or six of these per full caster in my party per long rest. It's really not that many casts of the six level spell slots, and they're competing with all of your upcasted spells. And so as a general rule, I'm only casting a handful of spells with a six level spell slot, and they are going to be fight deciding S tier spells for the most part. Arcane Gate just is not good enough to cut it, so even though it's a very interesting tactical spell, I almost never use it. Okay, we can move on now to Blade Barrier. Blade Barrier is also going into B tier. It's the same deal, even though it's B tier, I basically never cast a spell. So here's what it does. It's a wall spell, just like all the other wall spells we've covered. There are going to be two more wall spells in this level as well. This will summon a wall that does 6 die 10 slashing damage to targets that fail a dexterity saving throw in its area. It also counts as difficult terrain. A very good 
zone control spell, one of the better zone control spells in the game, but because it's a 6 level spell slot, I'm just never casting this. Basically, I use Wall of Fire if I want a wall spell, not Blade Barrier. So that's Blade Barrier, B tier. We can do Chain Lightning now. Chain Lightning is going into A tier. This is a very interesting spell. I wish I could cast this more. Let's look at it here. So this is a spell you cast on a single target. That target will make a dexterity saving throw or take 10 day lightning damage, half as much if they succeed on the save. On top of that, the Bolt of Lightning will jump to up to three other enemies within range of it. So you can pretty reliably hit this on four enemies. Even if there are allies in the AoE, they're never going to get targeted by this, right? So it's a faux AoE only spell that does 10 day lightning damage. It's actually a lot of damage. You could expect this to do 45 lightning damage on a hit. It should be hitting most of the time at this point of the game because of arcane acuity. Of course, against wet targets, that's doubled. So that's 90 damage per target that you hit with this, with four targets, what is that, 360 damage total with this cast of a spell? That's actually incredible. I mean, that's like decent, it's, I mean, it's all right single target damage, and then the fact that you turn that into AoE, amazing. It's probably the best AoE damage spell in the game if it wasn't a six level spell slot. Usually though, I just prefer to cast Cone of Cold on an Evocation Wizard, rather than use my six level spell slot on Chain Lightning. Next up is Circle of Death. Circle of Death is going into B tier. It probably, just for its effect, it's like a C tier spell, but it bumps up a tier for me because it's a necromancy spell. So here we are. This is a AoE spell, but you cast it on a single enemy target, and then everyone within nine meters or 30 feet of them is gonna make a constitution saving throw. If they fail that saving throw, they're gonna take eight die six necrotic damage. So this is fireball damage which isn't even that good for a third level spell, much less for a six level spell. Then it's the fact that it's necrotic damage, not a very valuable spell type. This spell is extremely underwhelming. The thing is, it's a necromancy spell. And by act three, you can get the Staff of Cherished Necromancy and you can get a lot of free cast of necromancy spells, uh, even with a six level spell slot. So you can kind of use it that way. And I would consider it consistently average if you're using those spell slots for it. But yeah, I mean, it's really not even that good. Create Undead, another necromancy spell, but I'm putting this one straight in the C tier because even with it being necromancy, it's just so underwhelming. So Create Undead will summon a mummy. You have to cast this on the corpse of a target that is uh, medium size or smaller, I think, something like that. Or is it medium size or larger? I can't remember now. Uh, basically, a humanoid corpse you cast this on, it will summon a mummy. These are the stats of the mummy, roughly. The gist of the mummy is that if you attack a frightened target, it's going to get a multi-attack, which is 2 die 6 slashing damage, 3 die 6 necrotic damage, and has the chance to proc Mummy Rot. Mummy Rot is a condition that will last 10 turns. It reduces the target's maximum hit points by 8, and they cannot be healed while they have this condition. Very underwhelming, to be honest, because even though this stacks, it will only stack duration. So you can quickly get 50 turns of Mummy Rot, but you're not getting 50 stacks of that 8 extra damage of Mummy Rot, so you're never really reducing hit points by that much. It's just like a static 8 hit points, and they cannot be healed. And you could get that just from casting, like, the Cantrip uh, Chill Touch, or whatever Larian calls it in Baldur's Gate 3. So yeah, like this mummy just isn't good. If you want an undead summon, you're probably better off upcasting Animate Dead, the third level spell. When you upcast it as a sixth level spell, it gives you um, a lot of like flying ghouls, which is much better than the mummy. That said, you can cast both because it's a necromancy spell and you get all those free necromancy casts with the Staff of Cherished Necromancy. Still sucks. I don't know what to say. You can pretty much never cast this and you're not losing that much. By the way, the DC on that mummy rot is like 13. A 13 DC late game, not really great. All right. Um, Disintegrate is up next. That's going into RP tier. I hate this spell. Disintegrate is a single target damage. You cast it on a target and they'll make a dexterity saving throw. If they fail that saving throw, they will take 10 die 6 plus 40 damage. I think this will average around 75 force damage on a failed save. Of course, it deals nothing if they succeed on the saving throw and then you just wasted a 6 level spell slot, although that should never happen with Arcane Acuity. 
and you might be thinking, okay, 75 single target damage. Not bad, right? And it's force damage. You can double force damage against uh, targets that are frozen. Tough condition to get, but it's not impossible if you built around freezing targets. You could start disintegrating them for 150 single target damage. That's good, right? I mean, no. It's a six level spell slot to just do a flat one instance of a 150 damage, and that's under very specific conditions. And this exists in a game that has Curriculum of Strategy, the fifth level spell I reviewed in my last video. Just always cast Curriculum of Strategy. Don't cast this. It sucks. And by the way, if you ever do kill a target with Disintegrate, you lose all their loot. And because it's a six level spell, you want to save it for a boss, right? So yeah, just pass. It's a pass for me on Disintegrate. I bite. I bite actually is decent. I'm putting I bite in A tier, and this is a six level spell that I do cast quite a bit. Here's the thing: it's a necromancy spell. We've already talked about it several times for the spell level. You can get a bunch of free casts for that. What you do whenever you cast this spell is you cast it on an enemy and you choose an effect: either panic, sickened, or asleep. Asleep is the one you want pretty much every time. They're gonna make a wisdom saving throw. If they fail, they fall asleep for ten turns or until you hit them, which is probably gonna be right away. But yeah, it's sleep. It's guaranteeing a crit, which at this point of the game is a lot, and sometimes you can even get some CC out of it. What's really cool is you can start doing this for every turn. You can recast this for 10 turns or as long as you maintain concentration. So it's basically giving you for 10 turns a sleep cantrip at the cost of a 6-level spell slot. But it's a necromancy spell, so you're not even really using the 6-level spell slot a lot of the time. And now you're actually getting quite a bit of use out of a caster build without expending any spell slots, allowing you to hoard your spell slots for boss fights or, especially on sorcerers, I love the spell on sorcerers, you can just start convert converting those saved spell slots into sorcery points and absolutely nuke boss fights when you get into them. So this creates like a really good spell slot economy spell. And if you know how to play around sorcery points and stuff like that, you can really abuse this. So, yeah, I actually like I Bite quite a bit. I basically use it for all of the mob fights, and then I just go absolutely Nova in the boss fights. And late game, that can be really valuable, especially on a no reload run. I Bite is worth using for sure. Flesh to Stone is up next. That's an RP tier spell. One of the worst spells in the game, in my opinion. This is basically like a worse version of the Contagion spell, which I covered under the 5th level spells. I gave Contagion a B tier for a 5th level spell. A lot of people were mad. They felt like it deserved RP tier. I'm pretty confident that I'm right about it. But Flesh to Stone is worse than Contagion, and it's a spell level higher. The most valuable spell slots in the game. You should never cast this. It's so bad. Anyways, just to explain what it does, whenever you cast it on a foe, they'll make a constitution saving throw or become restrained. Moreover, they if they accumulate, each turn they'll make another saving throw, constitution, and if they accumulate three failures, just like with death saving throws, they're going to become petrified. Now, petrified is a very valuable crowd control effect, is basically an insta-kill, but you're already getting that from contagion anyways. So yeah, it's, it's just like Contagion, but worse. I don't know what else to say about it. I don't even want to talk about it. It's so disappointing. Globe of Invulnerability is next, and this spell is absolutely game-defining, incredible spell. It probably belongs in the top five spells in the game. For a single action, it is probably the most efficient way to spend your action casting a spell in the entire game. It's that good. The only reason I'd say it's not the best spell in the game is that you get it so late in the game and it's such a valuable resource to cast it. But from the actual effect that it gives you, it's the best spell in the game. So here we are, um, Globe of Invulnerability. You cast this and you are going to summon a 3 meter or 10 foot radius zone in a space within 18 meters or 60 feet of you. Everyone in that 10 feet zone is going to be immune to all damage for three turns or as long as you maintain concentration, right? So for three turns, you've created a zone where you can no longer take damage. It's absolutely incredible. Like you just summon this and you hoard all of your team into it. They're now immune to damage 
awesome. And then you can just pop outside of it and attack enemies on the outside. And even if enemies run into it, it doesn't really matter that much. You can just shove them out, attack them, and move back in. So as long as you can control this 10 feet zone, you're immune to all damage for three turns. It's the single best damage mitigating spell I can think of in the game. Incredible. And it's so consistent. Like, there's no saving throw. There's no way for them to break through. If you get the spell off, you're just immune to damage for three turns. On top of all of that, it's the only... I wouldn't say it's the only way, but it's the best way to reliably clear the final fight of the game. Now, uh, I have been playing with no reloads. And so, if you play an entire save file and you make it to the last fight and then you die because you didn't have a globe of invulnerability to cast, you will just kick yourself. So I always plan to have multiple globes of invulnerability spells, either in scroll form or spell slots, to cast when I get to that last fight. I usually cast it twice in the last fight, once to get to the platform, and then once when I'm on the platform doing the channel thing. I don't want to spoil anything, but there's like a channeling effect and a bunch of bad guys in this game that will spam magic missiles at you. So unless you have a globe of invulnerability or like a shield spell or something like that, you're just going to eat that, and potentially break concentration, and it's timed, so you don't have the time to lose concentration like this. So yeah, it's just, it turns that last fight into something that could be legitimately dangerous into a very easy clear. And when you've gotten this deep in a no reload run, or now a lot of people are playing honor mode runs, you want globe of invulnerability. It's extremely valuable. I always plan all of my team comps to have at least one character that can cast globe of invulnerability. That's how good it is to me. All right, enough said about that. Uh, moving on to harm now. Harm goes into B tier, probably around here. It's a single target damage spell. You cast this on an enemy and they'll make a constitution saving throw or take 14 dice 6 necrotic damage, half as much if they succeed. This damage will reduce their maximum hit points, won't just damage them, but actually reduces maximum, so they'll never be able to heal up that hit points that they've lost, but it also cannot kill them. This will average around 49 to 50 single target necrotic damage, which is very low for the spell slot, but it's a necromancy spell, so you can sometimes cast it. Next up is Heal. Heal goes into B tier. I'll probably put it around here. This is actually a healing spell that I like. I wish it was a 5th level spell, then I would actually cast it more. You cast this on an ally, and you will heal 70 hit points. Nice. It's a consistent amount. That's what I like about it. You're not rolling dice to see how many hit points you heal. It's just a flat 70 that you can depend on. And even at this point in the game, 70 will tank a fair amount of hits especially if you have any sort of defensive buffs or something like that. So you can actually, with an action, heal more than enemies can hurt you with an action. And that actually becomes valuable. Still pretty reactive, to be honest. If you want to mitigate damage, you're probably better proactively casting Globe of Invulnerability. But clerics can't cast Globe of Invulnerability, and they can cast Heal. So... Yeah, heal's decent. I still basically never cast it, because with my clerics, I'm always using their 6th level spell to cast Hero's Feast. This is going into S tier. Absolutely amazing. So Hero's Feast is an ally buff, and it's unlimited ally buff. It's buffing all of your allies within the area, and so if you have any summons or you plan on make uh, summoning summons, do that before you cast Hero's Feast. Whenever you cast it, all allies are going to get a condition until your next long rest, which makes them immune to poison, diseased, or frightened conditions. It will increase their maximum hit points by 12, so this will absolutely stack with an upcasted aid. A 5th level spell slot upcasted aid with Hero's Feast is, I believe, 32 uh, increase to your maximum hit points to you and all allies, including all summons. We're talking hundreds of hit points increased in total. Absolutely amazing. And on top of all of that, it will also give all of your allies advantage on wisdom saving throws until your next long rest. Altogether, these are just a lot of moderate, but altogether very significant defensive buffs. And it's not taking concentration. It's lasting until your next long rest. You can count on them. Incredible. The advantage on Wisdom Saving Throws in particular, extremely good. I always cast Hero's Feast every long rest as soon as I get it. I, yeah, I think it deserves S tier. Next up, Autoluke's Freezing Sphere. <laughs> Very interesting spell. Putting it into A tier. 
because of the kind of cheesy stuff that you can do with this. Not worth casting with your actual six level spell slots, but if you can hoard up some scrolls of this, <laughs> you can do some pretty fun stuff with it. So here is the spell. There's two variations of it. You can uh, use it to summon a sphere, which you can throw, or you can use it to just cast like a normal spell. When you cast it as a normal spell, you're going to pick a target and hurl a sphere of cold at them. It will deal to that target 10 die 6 cold damage if they fail a constitution saving throw. And it's also going to explode and deal that same damage in an AoE. Now this is saying 1.5 meters, 5 feet. That is not correct. I would say it's closer to 20 feet is what you're actually dealing. All enemies in that area are going to take cold damage. 10 die 6 cold damage. Now you can expect to deal around 36 damage I think per target that's hit with this which is not much. I mean sure you're doubling it against wet targets but why not always cast chain lightning instead? Well here's the reason. Like I said you can summon it as a sphere which you can throw as long as you throw it within 10 turns of summoning it. So if you hoard up enough scrolls of this you can summon a bunch of these and then it's like you're handing a 6 level spell slot to your allies that otherwise wouldn't be able to cast this. And also, throwing something takes an attack, not an action. Casting a spell takes an action. So you're actually lowering the action economy of this if you throw it instead of casting it as a standard spell. So as a kind of pre-buff, you could stack up a bunch of these, start the fight, hurl all of them on the first turn, and just nuke everything to death, completely Nova killing them in the first round of combat. Um, at least in theory. I've never done it because it's just too much setup for me. But uh, I have tested the spell and it should work this way. I don't see why it wouldn't. But yeah, it's way too expensive of a, of a thing to do with your actual spell slots. But with scrolls, uh, you could definitely clear an entire fight just with this strategy. So yeah, it deserves an A tier for that. Situationally amazing, I would say. Next up is Otto's Irresistible Dance. I'm also going to put this one into A tier, even though I never cast it. Honestly, there's an argument that this deserves RP tier, but I'm feeling generous today. Otto's Irresistible Dance is a single target CC spell. You cast it on an enemy, and that enemy will start dancing. No saving throw to resist. They will be unable to take actions or move, and you have advantage on attack rolls against them. They will have disadvantage on attacks ro attack rolls and dexterity saving throws. Decent, you know, uh, turn canceling ability that has no saving throw to resist, but for as long as you maintain concentration or for the next 10 turns, that target, when it begins its turns, will make a wisdom saving throw to see if it can break through the irresistible dance. So it's only the initial turn that there's no saving throw to resist. Now, a guaranteed CC effect is actually very, very valuable in this game. However, with the existence of things like arcane acuity, mental fatigue, reverberation, you can get guaranteed or near guaranteed CC effects trivially. You don't need to use a 6 level spell slot to get them. So for that reason, I never really cast the spell. That said, it is boosting that initial CC from a 95% chance of hitting to a 100% chance of hitting. And if you don't have a build that functions around stacking Arcane Acuity very quickly, this is even more valuable. I mean, a guaranteed hit is always valuable, so I'm willing to put this into A tier even though I don't cast it that much. We can move on now to Planar Ally. Planar Ally is going into B tier, I don't know, maybe around here. Uh, this is a summon spell. You know what, no, I'm gonna move it to here. So, whenever you cast this, you will summon until your next long rest either an elemental, a celestial, or a fiend summon. The elemental is a djinn, the celestial is a diva, the fiend is a cambion. I'm only going to really look at the djinn variation of this spell right now. The diva I actually covered in 5th level spells with the wizard spell, Sights of Seelie. It's exactly the same as planar ally diva, so you can go to that. Also, you can summon a cambion with the infernal rapier, which you can get in Act 2 and which I included in my Best Weapons of Act 2 video I made a while ago. You can go there if you want to hear about the Cambion. Either way, neither of these are as good as the Djinn in my opinion. I think they're pretty underwhelming. The Djinn is the best one to go for, but it's not even that good. The main thing it's got going for it is a kind of Thunder Wave cantrip that can do a fair amount of damage, and of course it can push targets. And pushing targets, even 
late game is very valuable. You can push them into your AoE crowd control effects, your AoE damage effects. You can push them off of cliffs. You guys know the deal. It has a teleport. It can make targets drunk. And it has this Sweet Plum Gales. I've never even used this. Right, yeah, DC 15 for one turn of Restrained. Not really worth doing. Anyways, that's the Djinn. It's technically alright. I just wish it wasn't a 6 level spell slot. I don't know what else to say. Next up is Sunbeam. Sunbeam's going into A tier. I think probably around here. Interesting spell. It can be worth casting for sure. So it's probably best to think of Sunbeam like the damage variant of Eyebite. It's similar in that when you cast this for 10 turns or as long as you maintain concentration, you can recast it every turn for free. So it's like a 10 turn of a, an attack cantrip. And this is an AoE attack that functions a lot like a Lux laser if you are one of the degenerates who plays League of Legends. I'm sorry, that's really not fair. I hear League of Legends playing is actually being considered as a legitimate mental illness, and I shouldn't make fun of it. Uh, anyways, it's a laser that does radiant damage, right? It has a very long range, 18 meters or 60 feet, and it's about a 3 meter width is what I would say. All enemies, uh, all targets in that area will make a constitution saving throw or take 6 to 8 radiant damage, half as much, on a successful save. This will average around 27 damage on a hit, which is very low for this level, but if you get multiple turns off on multiple targets, it definitely adds up. The important thing is that it is radiant damage, right? And making this probably the best spell in the game for stacking radiating orb, if it wasn't such a valuable spell slot to use it on. Still, if you're hitting radiant orb on a ton of targets, this will absolutely win you the fight, no doubt about it but I still prefer to cast the third level spell, Spirit Guardians. It's only slightly worse for spreading the Radiating Orb effect, and it's a much less valuable spell slot. But still, if you want to do a Radiating Orb Sunbeam uh, spell build, it will win fights, like, without a doubt. So I think it deserves A tier. Wall of Ice is up next. Wall of Ice is going into C tier. This is a confusing spell, and it has been bugged in previous versions of the patch, but I've tested it now on this patch, and it is working fairly consistently for me now. It's best to think of Wall of Ice as an upgraded damage variant of Wall of Stone. It does everything Wall of Stone does about blocking off parts of combat, breaking enemy vision, but it will also deal an initial 10 die 6 cold damage to everyone adjacent to it whenever you cast a spell. Furthermore, if you ever break the Pillars of Ice, it's going to leave behind a cloud which deals 10 die 6 cold damage, the same as when you initially cast it. So it's Wall of Stone, but with some added damage. The thing is, it's just really janky to get that damage off. I mean, there's the initial damage, but the initial damage is low. If you want any persistent damage, you have to spend actions breaking the ice, and that's really not worth it. If you want a persistent wall effect, you're probably going to do Blade Barrier and or Wall of Thorns, which is up next. I'm putting Wall of Thorns into B tier because it's pretty much the same as Blade Barrier. So Wall of Thorns is going to summon a wall, which deals 7 die 8 piercing damage to targets that fail a dexterity saving throw. Also, targets in that area are entangled if they fail a dexterity saving throw. And it is considered difficult terrain, but difficult terrain that actually quarters enemy movement. So it really adds up, it's a lot of movement effects, and it's doing 7 to 8 piercing damage to targets that move in it, if they're even able to move in it. I mean, you guys get the idea. Yeah, you're summoning like a damage, also difficult terrain wall, pretty much the same as Blade Barrier. Blade Barrier is slightly more offensive, because it's procking every round, rather than if enemies move in it. Um, however, the actual crowd control effects of Wall of Thorns are better. By the way, Blade Barrier is a Cleric spell, while Thorns is a Druid spell. So you're not ever really having to choose between them, it's just which class are you, right? And that brings us to the last spell in the entire game to review, and that is Windwalk. I'm really excited about this one because it's going into RP tier. This spell, it's just not worth it to me. For the spell level, basically this is an AoE version of Gaseous Form. Whenever you cast this, you will transform you and all of your party members near you into little clouds of mist. You'll have resistance to non-magical damage, advantage on physical saving throws. 
you become tiny in size, you can fly. It's really an exploration spell if you want to get your whole party through a pipe to infiltrate, I don't know, say the Steel Watcher area. That's what you're casting this for. Um, not really good in combat, unless maybe you're just trying to escape a combat that's gone south, but that never happens to me. And it will never happen to you. Now that you've listened to the full spell tier list, thank you so much for watching this video, guys, and all the videos that you've watched in this series. I've had a blast. The spell tier lists have not done that well for views for me, but it doesn't even matter because the community engagement has been so fun and honestly uplifting to me. Even though you guys have flamed me, it's just really fun to get a reaction, so I've absolutely enjoyed it. Now to end with the community announcement, I have recently hit 10k subscribers. Thank you guys so much for your support. Of course, I wouldn't have made this channel if I didn't expect to hit 10k eventually, but I hit it much sooner than I was expecting, and I genuinely feel honored. Anyways, I want to give back by making a AMA video, 10k subscriber AMA. If you've been around YouTube, you know this is pretty stock standard and a cliche, and I hate to be cliche, but honestly, I think an AMA video might be pretty fun. Now, you guys all know me from making standard tier lists on Baldur's Gate 3 for the most part, which is pretty dry educational material, and you might think this guy doesn't have a lot of personality, he's pretty boring, but honestly, you could not be more wrong. I am a super interesting person, I'm very fun at parties, and I think I can answer a lot of questions in a really interesting way, so I wanna try it out. So, if you want to submit a question for my 10k subscriber AMA, you can do so in the comments of this video. Just begin the comment with AMA question colon and then put down your question. You can ask me, of course, anything you want about Boulders Gate 3 or CRPGs. Of course, that is my area of expertise. I am particularly interested in CRPG history. I would love to get some questions on that. But also just general gaming you could ask me about that. Uh, d and tabletop role-playing. I've been a DM ever since I was 10 years old. You could ask me about that. I design my own uh, d and style systems. So you could ask me about game design. I'm an amateur writer. You could ask me about that. Uh, and you could just ask me questions about, you know, movies or art, uh, literature, philosophy. I just, just shoot and hopefully I can find an interesting answer to any of your questions. All right, guys, that is it for this video. Thanks again for watching. I'll catch you next time.